Onc Live Insights is a video editorial program produced by Onc Live. So the original study uh, that was done with adjuvant imatinib looked at patients only based on size criteria. Um, patients who had a three centimeter tumor or greater were randomized to receive placebo or imatinib, and there was a significant, significant benefit for the patients who received uh, Gleevec or imatinib um, in that there was an improvement in recurrence free survival for those patients. What was limiting about the study is they didn't take into account mitotic rate um, because it, at the time it wasn't clear how to assess the, the mitotic rate of these tumors in a uniform manner. So what also became apparent from this study was that after patients stopped Gleevec, there was a time where about six to 12 months later, the event rate in the placebo arm and in the imatinib arm um, started matching, became closer together, uh, the curves became closer together. So as such, um, it became apparent that there seemed to be a Gleevec effect. Uh, so a second study, the SSG study, was presented a few years ago at ASCO. Um, and in this trial, uh, patients who were defined as high-risk gists, so these were patients uh, who had tumors that were greater than 10 centimeters, uh, high mitotic rates, uh, tumors that were five centimeters with higher mitotic rates um, or tumor rupture. Uh, were, these patients were subsequently randomized to Gleevec for a year versus uh, three years. And what was interesting about this study is that it actually showed a survival benefit for the patients who received three years of Gleevec versus those patients who received one year of Gleevec. Um, so as such, um, it's changed our approach to uh, particularly the high-risk patients and the duration of therapy. Although I will say that the duration question remains an open question um, in terms of what is the optimal length of therapy to offer these patients. The important difference between the first trial and this particular trial is the patients on the second trial actually had high-risk features at baseline, meaning they had either uh, tumors that were greater than 10 centimeters of size with any mitotic count, any location. Uh, these were patients that had tumor rupture. These were also patients that had high mitotic counts regardless of the size. When patients were picked in this fashion, what was noted is that patients that received three years of imatinib had a, a, imatinib had a superior recurrence-free survival as well as an overall survival benefit compared to the one year of imatinib. And this has been demonstrated not only in the uh, seminal paper that was published in JAMA, uh, but also, uh, also in a follow-up study that was presented at ASCO 2015. So at this point in time, based on the clinical trials that have been presented and published, what we know is that patients that have high risk of recurrence uh, are patients that would benefit most from at least three years of imatinib. Importantly, the duration of treatment is still not well understood and there are in fact clinical trials that have been completed evaluating uh, treatment up to five years in the adjuvant setting. Data for these particular trials should come to fruition soon and may help guide us in terms of whether we need to continue imatinib beyond three years or whether patients should uh, essentially cease therapy at three years. Um, my personal opinion is that until we know better, patients that are at high risk of recurrence that are tolerating their imatinib therapy well uh, should most likely be considered to continue their therapy on. But this is clearly a decision that needs to be discussed between the patient and their treating oncologist. In patients who have undergone a complete surgical resection of their gist, it is important to follow these patients on a regular basis with physical examination as well as cross-sectional imaging. We usually recommend cross-sectional imaging with a CT scan of the abdomen and pelvis with IV and PO contrast if the tumor is located in the abdomen. For patients that have esophageal gist, we also recommend a CT scan of the chest with this. Per the NCCN recommendations, we usually do these scans every three to six months to follow patients. CT PET scan can be useful in many of these patients. However, what we found when we initiate the treatment with imatinib the SUV signal on the CT PET scan often decreases quite rapidly. So for ongoing treatment, using a CT PET scan often does not add to our assessment of the response to the treatment. 
More important to this is to use a proper CT scan with both IV and PO contrast. What we find in patients when we initiate treatment with imatinib is that the majority of patients respond to this treatment. Often we find that the solid tumor that is metastatic to the liver, for instance, becomes less solid, so there's a decrease in the density. We also find that the vessels entering into the tumor seems to decrease as well. However, the size of the lesion may not necessarily decrease. And for this reason, the response criteria that is routinely used in assessing responses to treatment, such as the RESIST criteria, may not be very useful in patients with um, may not be very useful in patients with GIST. Other criteria have been developed, including the CHOI criteria, that not only looks at size, but also looks at the density of the tumor, as well as the vascularity of the tumor. And these criteria have been shown to be more predictive of the response to treatment uh, in GIST compared to standard RESIST. For this reason, in many centers, we now use CHOI criteria to assess response to imatinib and also other receptor targeting kinases in the treatment of GIST. If the patient has a recurrence, we then recommend to perform a biopsy of the tumor to determine the mutational status of the tumor to best assess what treatment may be beneficial for patients with the recurrence. Once we have biopsied a gastrointestinal stromal tumor, or if the patient has undergone a surgical resection of the tumor, we often do immunohistochemical analysis with C-KIT, which is also known as CD117. We also do other staining on occasion, including DOG1, PKC theta, and PGFR. We also do mutational analysis to determine, specifically in patients who are C-KIT positive, what the mutations are. We know that the majority of patients with GIST have an exon 11 mutation. Other mutations include uh, mutations in exon 9, exon 13, and exon 17. We also know that how patients respond to treatment is dependent on these mutations.